Washington has used the leverage that comes from supplying nuclear materials to enforce non-proliferation principles, and that's becoming more difficult now that its role in the nuclear marketplace has declined. I'm Sean Lynn Jones. I edit the quarterly journal International Security here at the Belfer Center. Today I'm talking to Nicholas Miller, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. Professor Miller is the author of an article that appears in the fall 2017 issue of International Security. It's called Why Nuclear Energy Programs Rarely Lead to Proliferation. Thanks very much for being here today with us, Nick. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's the conventional wisdom on this connection between uh, energy programs and nuclear weapons programs? I would say that the conventional wisdom is that nuclear energy programs significantly increase the odds of nuclear weapons proliferation. I think there's three main reasons that are usually advanced for that. Uh, the first is simply that it provides states with the technical means to build nuclear weapons. Uh, a second reason is that countries with nuclear energy programs might have greater motivations to seek nuclear weapons. Finally, and maybe the most interesting argument is that a nuclear energy program could provide political cover for the acquisition of nuclear weapons. You question this argument. What's your perspective on this uh, alleged connection? Well, the first thing I would say is that policymakers aren't entirely wrong to worry about it. I think part of the reason why we haven't seen a strong association between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons proliferation is precisely because policymakers worried about this, this linkage and took effective policy steps to prevent uh, the nightmare scenarios from occurring. Uh, and because of those policy steps, I think there are two very important firewalls that kind of stand in between energy programs leading to the spread of nuclear weapons. The first is that Countries that have nuclear energy programs are likely to face higher levels of scrutiny of their nuclear programs, partly because nuclear energy programs are just very public endeavors that uh, involve hiring foreign firms to build reactors, for example, partly because policymakers are concerned that it might be a political cover for nuclear weapons, and so they start to pay closer attention to the program. The second reason I think that nuclear energy programs actually uh, create some obstacles to proliferation is that they make non-proliferation sanctions more likely and more costly. More likely simply because their nuclear activities will be more visible. It's more likely that a nuclear weapons program will be detected. And more costly because a country that relies on nuclear energy to fuel their economy is going to be very wary about losing the foreign inputs such as nuclear fuel and technology that are necessary for an energy program to thrive. Can you say a little bit more about the evidence for your arguments? It, it seems logical, but how has it worked out in practice? Uh, I show statistically that there is not a significant association historically between having a nuclear energy program and both the pursuit and acquisition of nuclear weapons. I also show that there is evidence for these firewalls that I highlight that might weaken the link between energy and proliferation. So for example, I show using declassified intelligence assessments that countries that are pursuing nuclear weapons under the cover of an energy program are actually much less likely to have their nuclear weapons program underestimated, so there's more timely detection. Can you give some examples? So a couple of examples would include Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, both of these countries had nuclear weapons programs in the 1970s. They justified a lot of their nuclear activities with reference to nuclear energy programs, but the U.S. was not fooled and detected these programs and then ultimately put intense pressure on them to halt them, uh, which turned out to be successful. We've gone through various phases of the nuclear era since Hiroshima. Do you think your argument will remain true in the future? I would say there's reasons to be optimistic and pessimistic. So we might be optimistic uh, because all of the countries that are likely to be large suppliers going forward are members of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Uh, these require uh, a degree of adherence to non-proliferation norms and principles like requiring safeguards on nuclear exports. On the other hand, I would say there are a couple reasons you might be pessimistic, uh, in particular because two countries that might play an increasingly large role in the nuclear market going forward uh, are China and Russia. And there are reasons you might be skeptical of their commitment to non-proliferation principles. Um, China has a very a bad track record historically in terms of non-proliferation. If U.S. tensions with Russia and China continue uh, in the coming decades, that, that might lead them to downplay their non-proliferation uh, advocacy. What's um, the advice that you would offer to policymakers about how to deal with this general situation going forward? Uh, it's in the U.S. interest to try to revive its role as a nuclear supplier. 
uh, because historically, Washington has used the leverage that comes from supplying nuclear materials to enforce non-proliferation principles, and that's becoming more difficult now that its role in the nuclear marketplace has declined. I would also say, in general, investing in uh, intelligence uh, efforts vis-a-vis -vis nuclear programs, whether in the United States or the IAEA, is certainly something that's worth doing because timely detection has been an important part of preventing proliferation in these cases. But I would also zoom out and say uh, the Trump administration should do as much as it can to just reaffirm the U.S. commitment to non-proliferation. Um, during the presidential campaign and even after the Trump administration has entered the White House, there have been some mixed signals sent about whether the United States would always be opposed to proliferation. So, for example, in cases like South Korea and Japan. And I think that sends the wrong signal. And we need the United States government to reaffirm that it is committed to non-proliferation. And it's committed to these policies that have succeeded in the past at breaking the link between energy programs and proliferation. Uh, we're just about out of time now, Nick, but thanks so much for being with us here today. I've been talking to uh, Nicholas Miller, who is assistant professor in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. He's the author of an article that was recently published in the fall 2017 issue of International Security, Why Nuclear Energy Programs Rarely Lead to Proliferation. Thanks again, Nick. Thanks for having me.